The simple and ingenuous pleasure of being in the center of so much power, so much speed. We are part of it. We are part of that race whose dawn is just awakening. Its power is like a torrent swollen by storms, a destructive fury. The city is crumbling. It cannot last much longer. Its time is past. It is too old. The torrent can no longer keep to its bed. It is a kind of cataclysm. It is something utterly abnormal. And the disequilibrium grows day by day. Surgery must be applied at the city's centre. Physic must be used elsewhere. We must use the knife. In April 1925, Paris was due to host a major exposition dedicated to arts and technology. Le Corbusier and Pierre Janneret, responding to the brief for a hypothetical house for the architect, submitted a proposal for a pavilion to explore the potential of standardization and mass production in residential architecture. Initially resisted by the organizers and highly controversial even today, the pavilion contained two parts a hypothetical unit within a large mass housing block, and an exhibition of two urban proposals, a conceptual city for three million people, and the notorious Plan Voisin, a radical vision for the reshaping of the urban fabric of Paris. The ideas demonstrated in the pavilion were developed further in a book released in the same year, Urbanism, released in English as The City of Tomorrow and Its Planning, and we're going to look at all three of them. This has been subject to an enormous culture war. There are a lot of people who think this is the worst thing that ever happened in the history of architecture. What they say is Corbusier is bad because he was the embodying and driving force for post-war redevelopment of Europe, particularly by expect the world's cities, um, which was based around knocking down the Victorian terraced housing and turning it into blocks and slabs. The pavilion of the Esprit Nouveau is where all of these proposals come together, but it's the thing that we really want to talk about last. So we're going to start off by talking about the book. The pavilion is the thing which provokes the greatest reaction. It's the great provocation. It's fairly clear that that's what he designed it to be. Although the book came out slightly after the pavilion, it is rather like Towards the New Architecture, cobbled together out of uh, a number of articles he wrote for Esprit Nouveau over the preceding half decade. To, to kind of recap, the early 1920s, Corbusier is not yet a successful architect. He's writing with Aux Enfants, this magazine, which is propaganda piece for him, his architectural practice, and their ideas about the future of design and man's place in it in the industrial era. And there's a whole series of books that come out of it. And this is the Urban Proposal which is one of the two really famous ones. And we're kind of getting towards the end of the Esprit Nouveau era here. It's, it, I think it ceases business in the mid-late 20s, but really he's got everything he needs out of it. Once he's actually doing buildings, the books take on a different meaning. He still engages very much in propaganda, but it's easier to talk through work for him. Should we start with chapter one? So, the, so to talk, give an overview of the book, there's a general essay on urbanism. There is a conceptual proposal f for an ideal city. And there's a concrete proposal for the redevelopment of Paris. And I would say in the first part, there's sort of two broad categories. Some of it deals with what he would regard as universal principles of urbanism across time and space. And some of which deals with the particular problems of the new industrial society and the great city that exists within it, the city of many millions of people. And he starts with the universals, with the one which I think probably is one of the most important ones to understand when understanding his work, because I think it shows a sensibility in him which never really goes away. It's called Le Chemin des Hommes. And le chemin, how do you pronounce Oh, Le Chemin des Hommes, Le Chemin le des Hommes. So the, the, it sort of rhymes. Yeah. The uh, the road of donkeys, the road of men. Yeah. Or, or asses. Asses is what asses, I say. Asses, really. Because yeah. it's not... Donkeys is different, isn't it? They turn up on the menu more than asses. It, it's probably w worth saying that even in comparison with Towards an Architecture, the rhetoric, uh, the kind of hyperbole is turned up a little bit. Uh, and the chapter makes very clear what it's about right from the first lines where he says that man walks 
straight because he has a purpose. He knows where he's going. A man walks in a straight line because he has a goal and knows where he is going. He has made up his mind to reach a particular place and go straight to it. The ass meanders along, meditates a little in his scatterbrained and distracted fashion. He zigzags to avoid larger stones, or to ease the climb, or to gain a little shade. He takes in the line of least resistance. Man governs his feelings by reason. Blah, 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 blah. And that carries on for a few pa- um, paragraphs. Very much in that line. And then in the essay, he gives the examples of cities which have meandering streets, which have evolved over time, i.e. Antwerp, Contemporary Paris, and cities which are on grids. So we're looking, I mean, in the in the book, we're, we're immediately looking at lots of city plans, and these are historic city plans with that characteristic medieval wiggliness. Um, and he's reacting here particularly against a sort of pre-existing urban theory, which is that of Camilo Zitter, which is he reads as being in praise of the wiggly line this uh, this um examination of historic cities like you know Florence for example what do architects or urban planners want, always compare everything to that's good uh italy a tuscan hill village a, a tuscan hill village a yeah. tuscan hill town I don't think it's just Zitter. That's, I think this has been around for quite a while. I think it, it, it's, a, it's a romantic or picturesque notion. It's certainly been around since the 18th century. And there's a divide, isn't there? You like order, rigidity, or you like wiggles at a really basic level. Or people, you know, obviously like some combination. There's the French garden. There's the English garden. Corbusier is very clear. Man is not an animal. He is also, Westerner is not a nomad or a barbarian or a cannibal. (laughs) He is civilised and the master of creation. And nature should conform to his will. Always. There is a mountain in the way, smash it down. We don't take the path of least resistance. The, The rhetoric for this is essentially cosmological. It is, we are under a vast sky, the right angle is the relationship between heaven and earth. It is the relationship between the infinite and us. Everything must conform to specifically right angles and a right angle grid. Uh, Yeah, so the heroes of this little historical sketch are the Romans and Louis XIV. And the real hero is, is a sort of Nietzschean archetypal superman. So do we want to go on do we want to talk a bit more about order or because he, I mean, even in the first chapter he he mentions and this is very much a retread of the form of rhetoric in towards new architecture he says well there's a particular pressing reason in our age why we can no longer build these roads of donkeys which is the advent of the automobile I don't think we need to get into that too much because so much of the rest of the book is about that but the whole book is a frame of there's the universal and there's the immediate. Yeah. And in a way, they're the same that they've always been, which is the universal is, you know, man man in his position in the universe, and the immediate is, my God, isn't, isn't life very busy? It's the eternal cry that things cannot go on like this. Whereas in Towards the New Architecture, the objection is primarily aesthetic, isn't it? It's all of these terrible swags and frills and folder rolls are suffocating us. The, the, arg- the argument which he's going to make in this book is much more rooted in his mind at least in actual sort of practicality or actually matters of life and death almost as he frames them i think i might disagree yeah i would say the main the thrust of the points that he emphasizes most are aesthetic or cosmological and then he includes a lot of material which is statistical or from news. He includes a number of chapters on finance or practical exigencies. But three things, I would say, are key. There is one from the modern era. So it's it's that we exist in a cosmos yeah. and we must make it conform to our will. Certain aesthetic principles he believes to be correct. And he also believes that those aesthetic principles are bound up in the character of the society that creates them and that we live in a machine age where anything can be accomplished by harnessing mechanical means. 
there has to be a reason for us returning to these eternal principles. And the reason is that the city we're surrounded by is not only less than ideal, but actually abject, harmful to health, likely to need, lead to nervous breakdown of various kinds, causing all sorts of illnesses and uh, privations. He would say, it's like that because it's unsanitary, but primarily it's like that because it's not right angles. Primarily it's like that because it's not vast. So should we sketch some of the other uh, chapters? We've got order is number two. Really, order is sort of including the stuff that we've set. This is where he sets out the cosmological relationship. He also has quite early on uh, a statement about why he's saying this. I, if I may appear to be trying to force open an already open door. So he's writing this in Esprit Nouveau. He's talking to the converted. Some people have said this in my earlier book, Towards a New Architecture. It is because in this case... I'm speaking of town planning, certain highly placed persons who occupy strategic points on the open battlefield of ideas and progress have shut these very doors, inspired by a spirit of reaction and misplaced sentimentality, which is both dangerous and criminal. So that's pretty straightforward. He is speaking against picturesque town planning and um, conservation and that sort of thing. And then in the rest of, you know, man, this is a quote, Created by the universe is the sum of that universe, and as far as his, as he is himself concerned, proceeds according to its laws and believes he can read them. But he goes on, you know, we exist under a, a sky. It, the, the language is very poetic, or um, purple. Yeah, I mean, it, I mean, it is worth making the point here that in trying to evoke this primal or essential condition, he is restaging one of the absolutely foundational a sort of rhetorical tropes of French architectural theory, which is the idea of basing an architecture on the primal work, the primitive hut. So uh, harking back to the 18th century and um, Marc-Antoine Logier, the idea that, that one can define what kind of propriety in architecture is by the extent to which it has this genealogical descent from the primitive hut. So in the case of Logier, it's like columns have obviously got to be freestanding. They can't be engaged in a wall. I think he's kind of um, in the other camp, actually. There's a page here quite early on where he has a double page spread. And on one side, he has images of a primitive hut. And on the other side, he has, he has drawings of ancient Egyptian dwellings. And he's saying there have been through humanity two trains of thought, the animal and the ordered. And the genealogical descent of the primitive hut leads to a deranged, a whole deranged genealogy. And the Egyptian house leads, you know, which is square and uh, orthogonal, leads to this through the, the, the lineage of great men and great cities. The, the notion of, the prim of, of going back to the primitive hut and its descendants, I mean, is, is something which has existed, I think, through the entire history of architecture rule theory it's 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 a major thing in vitruvius he, you know romulus's hut is this important basis and you know this is why we make temples in such and such a way i think he's trying actually to break away from that i think he um sees uh, uh, um, sort of two sides of the human spirit the animal and the universal and to suppress the animal um, you know imagine you were going to come up with some principles of urbanism today there would be an approach which is to say what are the absolute requirements of life in this contemporary moment? And we have no need to consider what conditions were like in history or what the history of the city is like at all, because that has nothing to tell us about our position right now. The other is, let's go back to the mythic start point of the city and define our principles in relation to those. The rhetoric or the kind of process of argument, city building is a thing which has gone on throughout history. And as long as there's been city building this f form of order has been the essential principle which is had to cohere to. If you're going to say, well, let's design a, a contemporary city in the machine age, it's not intuitively obvious that the, most, that the first reference you should look at is the ancient Egyptian house. The discourse then as now has got a lot of history in it. Not good reasoning. 
you've got to make reference to how the city, you know, how cities grow, live and die. And I think that was even more true in his day, coming out of the era of sort of the That's not the way in which it's perceived, though. I mean, this is perceived as being a proposal which it, which is entirely based around a, a functional rhetoric, isn't it? Maybe. Not by everyone. It, there are a lot of people writing lectures on his um, mysticism and cosmography. Yeah, but that in itself is kind of revisionist, isn't it? I mean, the, if, you think of what, if you think about how anti or sort of post-international modernism constitutes itself... It's in opposition to a functional reading of the city. I mean, that's what, that's the way in which Rossi, for example, sets up his entire, um, his entire kind of ground of debate, isn't it? But this is the same as towards New Architecture. And towards New Architecture, he's doing the same. He's not really interested in the middle ground, right? He's interested in the timeless, eternal properties of man, which is why he likes tumble-down Doric temples. Yeah and motor cars and he puts them on the page and says that these things are have an equivalence which is that they are you know blah 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 but really those are the things he's attracted to and what he's not attracted to is most of the middle no i think that that's true i think it's i think it's just important to appreciate although this is an architecture of the machine age the parthenon is as central to this conception of what architecture is. Although it's, he has slightly strange notions of the past, I think he likes the deep past because he, it is untroubled by details that might contradict what he's saying. Yes, well, we'll get on to the attitude of the past when we get on to the plan voisin. I want to go over the description again of the double page spread. You've got a page spread with the hut and the Egyptian house. And the hut, they're circular, the three of them, and there are tools which are wonky and circular. And there's a primitive person. And on the other side, there are Egyptian houses which are entirely laid out on a grid. And it really is almost in the style of comparisons by Pugin. It's yeah. bad, good. Circles, bad. <laughs> Wiggly, wobbly circles, grids, good. Yeah, he's got their whole kind of material culture summed up, doesn't he? He's got sort of bashing tool house and digging maybe we can continue the conversation about the about going about the images because then if you, if you turn the page we've got an egyptian temple again very axial very orthogonal overview of ancient babylon on the river not sure what you meant to make of that we've got peking also very much a rectangle babylon is this shows the sort of systematic tendency which is that there's an archaeological plan of ancient babylon on which someone has drawn three squares which are really are three squares derived from two points, the sort of squares that you can yeah, make out of anything. Reconstruction. The reconstruction is square. Yes. Um, and then we've got a wiggly road with a car driving down it. And then there's a picture of a tennis court and two people engaged in, in some sort of play. What's the, what's the interpretation of those? Oh, so what's going on here is... There's a discussion of, like, why roads would be straight and be wiggling. The, the, the text, when you get down to it, is difficult because he sort of waffles on and goes on on loads of tangents. It's almost like it's us. Uh, and suddenly he'll see something he likes. But essentially, he's making an argument which is nature is chaotic. We make it conform to our will. So a road can curve if it's ramping up a hill. Objects can be curvy if there's a reason, you know, a bentwood chair industrially produced is fine to be curvy because the human body is curvy, a violin the same. Tennis court is good because it's rectilinear and is the imposition of nature. Tennis is a good sport played in people wearing jerseys. And the nomad hut, which is the you know, camp, which is the last thing, is just him saying... Yeah. It's him re-emphasising this thing, which is that the nomadic spirit lives within the city yeah. and it is the force of reaction. Uh, we must rid ourselves of nomad, nomad, nomadism. It's the same as that yeah. original pairing. And the Egyptian grid and the nomadic hut, they're there at the same time. This spirit has never gone away. It's not present in me, but it is in these troglodyte town planners and their obsession with ironmongery. Yeah, it's got the. It's, there's a picture of a water plane, I think, flying in front of a skyscraper, and it says, "We are no longer nomads, and we must build cities." 
above which is a charming little town which is to be um, bulldozed or um, burnt down or something. <laughs> so there's a bit of... Um, I've been reading it in French, which means that I don't really understand very much of what's going on. But this one, chapter three is called The Feeling Overflows. Yeah, I, I wrote The Sentiment Overflows, yeah. yeah. As in, like, it's overflowing with feeling. Yeah. Which starts off with this amazing little sketch of the barbarians have passed... And uh, what, what is it saying that they? they uh, there's it's, no, there's, it's not the barbarians have passed. So Rome has fallen, yeah. and a barbarian in his cart has come along. He sees these stripped back, huge primal shapes yeah. of the Roman temples, big vaults and things, and he feels a primal urge drawn towards it, but he can't understand it, and so he mucks it up. Broadly, this chapter is about how he doesn't like Gothic architecture. It's not just that he doesn't like Gothic architecture, it's he doesn't like what the Academy likes in Gothic architecture because he doesn't like the Academy. There's a number of enigmatic drawings. There's one enigmatic drawing, which when I originally only had this in French, I was like, I just spent quite a long time trying to work out what on earth he was banging on about. And the diagram is a, it's a square diagram. At the bottom, there are two rows of three sections through churches which are, like, simple to complicated, you know. The simple one is, like, an arch, and then the complicated one's got loads of flying buttresses and columns. It's it's the kind which you do see in histories of medieval... Well, kind of quite old-fashioned histories of architecture showing the rise of the Gothic style and the churches gradually advancing and getting yeah, bigger. Yeah, I got a Bannister Fletcher up and I'm sure yeah. I'm sure we could find yeah, an yeah, equivalent yeah, yeah, image yeah. in that if we felt I, like doing some actual... in one of my lectures. And but and then in the top left corner he's stuck a section of the path of the pantheon on there and then across the top he has got a big arrow and it says barbarians invasion of barbarians invasion of barbarians yeah i.e what turns pantheon into shark is the infusion of savage nomadist blood because the pantheon is much bigger in the section than all of these it's because when you don't understand something, you complicate it. The, the man who's going through the ancient Rome, he feels the pure essence of the Roman buildings and he strives towards it, but he's not pure of spirit. And so he starts to revel in complication because he's a barbarian. And that is how architecture degrades. Yeah, and you can see it degrading and degrading until it reaches the apotheosis of degradation, which is the facade of the cathedral at uh, Rouen, Here we have a cathedral, with its pointed forms and jagged outlines. It's evident that there's a desire for order, but lacking completely in the calm balance which witnesses a mature civilization. And that's the overflowing sentiment. It doesn't look so bad. No, it's amazing. (laughs) Rural Cathedral is amazing. It's it's like this amazing thing because it's built in all these different periods. It was one of these ones that's built very slowly. So you get this real jumble of styles all stuck together but all very detailed. It's very good. Yeah, quite a cool city, I think. Um, towards the end, I don't know how much else there is to say about this chapter, but at the end, there's one of these enjoyably bizarre pieces of graphic provocation, a blank rectangle in which the centre of which is written place for a work of modern sentiment. Between the chapters, he has aphorisms or witty things. Or, well, like modern spirit, a place for... A, yeah. yeah. He's got a load of strange diagrams in this chapter as well. There's three, one of which is the um, invasion of barbarians. There's one which is a graph of two lines crossing. The point is Rouen Cathedral is the low point, And one of the lines going in is culture and the other one's savagery or something. Culture is gradually increasing. I think the, the Louvre facade of Perrault. And he's got another diagram, which is Ziggurat, Saint-Chapelle, Chevron, American skyscraper, bad, circle, square, triangle, good. Yeah, let, we'll put some of those on the internet. People were much more emphatic back in the yeah, that's why olden it, days, weren't I mean, they? It is all, it's, a lot of this is nonsense, but it's you know where you stood with people, don't you? It's, kind of like, it's the opposite of Comparisons by Pugin, which is a, a famous book which was mainly plates, as in drawings, where he would go, medieval feudal civilization, a monastery, industrial civilization, a prison. One of the best ones, I think, is... With him, which is the other way, other way around to this is Stonehenge, Doric Temple, Georgian Townhouse, Square Windows, bad. Yeah. <laughs> They're three things with pointy windows. Good. The true religion. Yeah, and that one would be like savagery, human sacrifice, and baby eating, and you know. 
nowadays there's a real problem of interpretation isn't there there's a real kind of hermeneutics also there is a problem of um the artwork in its age of re- mechanical reproduction which is that now um you can just sort of make your own images really easily with a computer or photoshop them so you don't have to take your image of how awful the georgian house is from a uh, architectural history book saying how great it is so that both images won't be beautiful. These I mean, are all sort of nicely presented because they're all culled out of, you know, image archives and both sides are using the same images. So what's the next chapter? Permanence. Oh, I mean, really, he's banging on about the same stuff in another essay, basically, here. Yeah. I mean, it really is like circle, square, good. We could talk about the pictures. There's lots, zigzag, of, lots of bridges in this one. Zigzag, bad. Here's another idea that runs through it, which is that humanity can progress without great individuals. And that the power of the industrial society transforms the mediocre human flesh through unthought collective action into magnificence by creation of ideas. And is that the point of all of these bridges? Is this the heroism of the machine age? Is this the heroism of of kind of collective labour? Yeah. It's also that the this is his statement against engineers trying to make things beautiful, which is really strange. That engineers should only follow the pragmatic, which is the opposite of what he sell, say, says elsewhere. So he says, but it is, and he's talking about the engineer being tempted to make things beautiful because of man's natural enthusiasm. But this is a dangerous judgment, for we shall see engineers trying to turn themselves into men of aesthetic sensibility. That would be the real danger, for their equipment would no longer develop. An engineer should stay fixed, remain a calculator, for his particular justification is to work within the confines of mere reason. This is also the chapter where he introduces New York, which becomes quite an important counterexample, because it's a city which seems to express futurity it's incredibly developed it has all of these amazing skyscrapers but it's completely contrary to his lacking in spirit he uses the examples of new york and chicago quite a lot and he says people will say we'll end up with my plan we'll end up with a city as bad as chicago or new york but it's because they're done without spirit and incorrectly they don't have any rectangles or cylinders all the shapes are slightly jaggedy there's no trees yeah, there's, there's a caption where it goes, Enthusiasm, admiration, beauty, never, confusion, chaos, cataclysm, and so on. It's like... The <laughs> translation is, The discovery of the new world that has been made subject for poetry, inspiring and enthusiasm and admiration. As for beauty, there is none at all. There is only confusion, chaos and upheaval. Mm, yes. And then there's a picture of New York. That's it, essentially, yes. He, uh, I mean, he sort of bangs on a bit more. The... The next section is classification and choice. Or actually, that's not very good translation, is it? It's type and choice, where he says the same thing again. It starts with an image of Pisa, and he says Pisa is made of cylinders and rectangles, and it's stunningly beautiful and lovely. And one of the key things is he goes through a number of cities, particularly Istanbul, cities from history, essentially, and analyses their skylines and then also an- analyzes the spirit of the city rome war organization civilization siena heaven and hell tumult and anguish and he says siena heaven and hell tumult and anguish it's like all ups and downs and jaggedy that's bad rome has got these domes and things in it so it's got civilization but it's also got straight lines so it's got war istanbul is gentle and oriental because it's got domes and arches. So, I mean, it's, we're essentially doing the sort of primary geometry fascination of towards the new architecture, but at the scale of the city rather than... Yeah, you know, with, the, with a sort of dollop of... It's not social Darwinism. It's before that. It's kind of like Aristotle. People have a character and the... Oh, right, yeah. I um, don't know how you would describe it. Like the humour system. You know, these people are phlegmatic, so their buildings have got triangular gables. That's how it goes on. And then there are some more complicated examples. He uses things that aren't just skylines, but essentially that's what it's about. The argument, the first chapter, he makes the point, we need right angles, order is necessary for human progress. And so is simplicity, is what the second chapter is, or clarity. And so are 
primary forms. And that's essentially what he's saying. We've got more we've got more type and choice. The that. second type and choice I say is more important than the first one because in here he's beginning to really nail down the things that he likes. Time and Choice has got some lovely pictures of it. It's got the, the Procuries in Venice, which is very tall and it is a clear manoeuvre cut into the city, very yeah. tall and grid-like. And he gives other examples of the Place du Vosges and you know, various other things. And in the, he's making an argument which is, is that he wants a city where the urban space, the ground layout, is varied so that you can go from a tight thing into an open space, but that, like the Place de Vosges or uh, the Procuries, all the buildings in detail should be the same. Right, yeah, so there's uniformity. So it's about the primary geometry of urban space rather than built form. And actually, the, the built form should be identical because that increases the grandeur. This is something you can experience in Vatican or, or in Paris in the Place de Vosges. In all of these places, actually, it's a good example. Um, what the key thing that happens is you go from a little narrow side street and you walk into this square, suddenly everything has changed and order is imposed upon you. Now, there's some problems with his argument, aren't there? Well, the big one is that the essence of what makes that rather stunning is the, is the transition from one thing to the other, isn't it? Yeah, whereas he just wants to transition from one of those squares to another one, all of which are exactly the same. Yeah, so you walk down the dark little street and then you come out into this glorious urban expanse full of pigeons or, or whatever it happens to be. It's a little bit like he just wants to eat ice cream for every meal or something like that, isn't it? But it's somehow you actually won't enjoy it anymore if you do. Yeah, because it you won't know. be ice cream. <laughs> yeah. it will be, it's just going to be cold. Uh, can I put the first caption in? Yeah. So there's this lovely picture, which is of the Procuries, and it's got all these um, birds flying across a white sky. The uniformity of the innumerable windows and vast walls on Piazza San Marco gives the same play as would the smooth side of a room. But the repetition of the same unit lends the wall a grandeur that is boundless and can be easily appreciated. The result of type form of a clear and simple nature. The pigeons of St Mark's themselves add their own unique uniform module, providing a varied and effective note to the scheme. And a close reading of that would tell you a lot about this essay, which is that he's making a statement which is poetic and has got bits of logic, but which also has the seeds of its own destruction. You can't argue that what makes the uniformity nice is the pigeons if you're going to have a city where everything is going to be the same. Yes, I mean, imagine imagine Venice where everything was St Mark's Square. It would be very weird, windswept, quite horrible. <laughs> but he actually, in the remainder of the chapter, anticipates this question, and his answer is simple. We put trees everywhere. The city must be full of wildness, gives examples of Istanbul. And the picture that he uses to illustrate how he imagines it will be is not like a sort of French garden where they're ordered, but of really anarchic landscape garden. What I think he calls later a jardin anglais. Uh, yeah, the English garden, you know, the picturesque. Yeah. And he sees that the picturesque will disrupt the module or will have a module, you know, which is inherently sort of rough. Got that rough textural element that is one of, another one of his signifiers. And that'll solve the problem. So it will be fine having ice cream all the time, because it's got like, because sometimes it's got chocolate chips and sometimes it's got. Um... <laughs> yeah. Well, we're going to come back to this. This is a solution which he uses to solve or to address a multitude of very obvious shortcomings in his proposals. Following this, we've got these chapters, which are these statistical ones. So we're going into science world here. And car world. There's a slight break between the two sections. We've dealt really with the universal themes. I think we'll deal with the statistical ones quicker. Beginning of the this jump, there's a quote. And what about the motor cars? So much the better, replied the great authority, that they will no longer have the run of the streets. So he's worried that urban planners are resisting cars. Yeah. Well, I've got a quote here, actually. I think from a letter where he says, Then there came the autumn season. In the early evening twilight on the Champs-Élysées, it was as though the world had suddenly gone mad. After the emptiness of the summer, the traffic was more furious than ever. Day by day, the fury of traffic grew. To leave your house, 
meant that once you had crossed the threshold, you were a possible sacrifice to death in the shape of innumerable motors. I think back 20 years when I was a student. The road belonged to us. We sang in it and argued in it while the horse bus swept calmly along. On that first day of October, on the Champs-Élysées, I was assisting at the titanic reawakening of a completely new phenomenon, which three months of summer had calmed down a little. Traffic. Motors in all directions, going at all speeds. I was overwhelmed. An enthusiastic rapture filled me. Not the rapture of the shining coachwork under the gleaming lights, but the rapture of power. He's basically in these really arguing for modern transport and away from rom- romanticism. Do you want me to outline the great city? Yeah, let's go back to the back to the plan. Yeah, so we've got these two chapters, the great city and the uh, and statistics. Le Grandville, it sort of means it's like the metropolis, isn't it? It's this thing of the, the city. Yeah, uh, for, for him, what it means is the city of many millions, yeah. essentially, in the industrial world. I'll do a quick synopsis. The great city. He likes big cities. He has images of great cities from antiquity, which are square. There's a fantastic diagram of Peking on a grid with a huge palace and everything is organised. The law of survival operates perpetually and with recurring brutal force. The great city, with its throbbing and its tumult, crushes the weak and raises the strong. And here it is, created by the peaceful hinterlands, and we shall find the transcendental and vital cell. So... For him, the great city through all time is the centre of competition which pushes forward society. It is where the weak are crushed. (laughs) It is where the strong are raised up and they are the burning lights of progress. That's a universal for him. We keep saying Peking because that's what it says in the book. I think it's still what the French call it, isn't it? Um, Yeah, it's what we called it until relatively recently. And it's still the University of Peking, Beijing. (laughs) Uh, (laughs) I think people know that, don't they? Isn't it just the difference between Cantonese... Or is it like... Is it Wei Giles or is it Cantonese versus Mandarin? I think it's just dialects within Mandarin. Beijing. The northern capital. And it's it's lovely and rectangular. Yeah, it's lovely and rectangular. I'll just other historical examples are given from the Renaissance, antiquity, Asia, of gridded cities and how wonderful they are and how they are these places of great complexity, strength, burning lights. Civilization. This is where civilization it's a dialectic civilization. And in a way, amidst the dialectic where it's the cities are great because the weak are crushed and the strong are raised up. I think that might even be an agonistic civilization. Yeah, agonistic. It, yeah. yeah, absolutely. If we want to go back to, to yeah. definitions of agonism. But there's another struggle, which is order and disorder. Blah, 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 blah. He rehashes those arguments. He says that cities have, since the industrial era, we have this new phenomenon, which is the city of, of many millions. The great cities of history were a city of a million. Cities have expanded explosively, but in our mechanical age, death knocked constantly at the door. The influx of people into the old cities has made them centres of death and full of squalor and filth and awfulness. And we are being held back by the law of least resistance, the lack of responsibility and respect for the past. Then essentially, he goes, people have proposed we escape and build garden cities, there are some problems with garden cities, these sort of obvious ones, which are like, he doesn't like that they're picturesque, but also he thinks that we've got to keep the city. We've got to keep this great agonistic city going. And for that, you can't just escape to these frou-frou. We've got to re-energise the city. And there's this sinister diagram with something which looks like a diagram of lots of roots coming together, but with a sinister arterial, slightly clotted look to it. And then below it, it's got this thing like a bullseye, which is about decongestioning the centre. It's got four points. We must decongest the centres of cities in order to provide for the demands of traffic. We must increase the densities of the centres of cities in order to bring about the close contact demanded by business. So what's great about these cities of antiquity is that they're dense and they're competitive. And the more dense the city is, the more competitive it will be and the greater progress will be. We must increase the means by which traffic can circulate. 
i.e. we must modify completely the current conception of the street. It has been shown itself to be re- useless regarding the new phenomenon of modern means of transport, subways, motorways, trams and aeroplanes. So we must have streets that can accommodate aeroplanes, the underground, trams. Streets for aeroplanes? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. There's, there's. Uh, uh, oh, I mean, when we go later on, we'll, we'll yeah, expand. All all. Kind of he does all of these things, and then the fourth point is we must increase the area of green open spaces. This is the only way to ensure the necessary degree of health and peace to enable men to meet the anxieties of work occasioned by new speed of business. Maybe could, I could just observe in passing that one of the really signal contradictions of this vision for the city is between points one and four. That on the one hand concentration and density is said to be absolutely fundamental to the city and to its operation and to this status as the heroic intensifier of civilization. And on the other hand, what we need to do is to create conditions for peace and quiet universally in the middle of this place. Boredom and concentration (laughs) at the same time. It's points two and four. What does the next paragraph say? These demands seem irreconcilable, but he has the solution. Massive towers. They're not. They don't seem irreconcilable. They seem contradictory, yeah. which is not the same thing. His solution: yeah. massive towers. There's a diagram. You know, the city of the 14th, 18th, and uh, 19th centuries. They become more dense. Which we saw figure plan um, diagrams. I'm going to have 60 story towers, and he says a 60 story skyscraper built on five percent of the land can be as dense as a, a six story buildings built on half the land yeah and he's got his two proposals which i think we'll probably go into later but essentially he says i can do this by means of architectural design modern design can solve these irreconcilable differences and bring about a new sort of city but it will be a city which is like the old cities it is dense and it has a center yes which is something lacking in the garden city and in fact, there's a relationship with Bruno Tout, right? This is his notion of the thing, the energising thing in the centre of the city is a city centre. Whereas Bruno Tout thought it was a Stadtkrown. It's a sort of mythic, empty thing. Although, in its own way, this, this is, a is also, empty yeah, it's also a vision of crystalline emptiness. Um, there are actually three more chapters of this to go through, but I think that they don't necessarily merit all that much attention statistic as far as i can tell is mostly lots of graphs about people being run over by motor cars to support points variously made earlier also graphs of center of paris is the population isn't increasing because it's saturated these cities are becoming dens of tuberculosis and traffic accidents yeah the city literally cannot expand it's at the point where expansion brings about death and destruction and he states it in quite stark terms He's got a really strange book. He doesn't understand algebra. (laughs) And he uses some algebra. What's the quote at the beginning of statistics? It's like, statistics, so tiresome and yet so powerful. Oh, God, yeah, what does it say? (laughs) I don't know. It's uh, like, that's a pithier version of it. (laughs) God, yeah, no, it does go on a bit, actually. Um, Yeah, yeah. (laughs) and then there's another chapter, which is cuttings from newspapers, which are all like, traffic accidents up 500% sort of thing. And there's lots of them. Um, and there's a whole chapter of that basically with um, a minimal comment and then the final chapter is this which does deserve it yeah which is called key. it's our uh, our means or what's it yeah. was it was it translated uh, as our equ- he's said our technical equipment but it, but this is a sort of a montage of futuristic and empowering references showing what civilization is capable of and which which presumably we're going to draw on for the construction of this new science fictional metropolis. So if I look at it, we've got a picture of an enormous dam being built with all of this amazing cable-stayed lifting equipment. We've got the construction of the underground. We've got uh, an enormous floating runway at sea. It, we've got the Great Wall of China, 3,000 kilometres long. You know, dare to dream. Nothing is too big. There's several sort of ideas. The first one is he's got this rhapsodic notion of a construction of a dam and in his description of it all that people are doing to build this dam is oiling and polishing machinery basically while enormous quantities of concrete and things are swept up by machines and mixed by machines and put into formwork constructed by machines 
and that with only a few people and with the industrial capacity of the whole world, products from Switzerland and America and Germany and England and France are brought together, assembled into the machines that will then build this enormous dam. And he says, that's the future. We will can marshal the entire world's resources. And with that, our ability is almost limitless. That's definitely not how dams were built. If you look at, think about how the Hoover Dam was built, it was created as an employment scheme. And yeah, it generated, it wasn't just five people polishing some sort of... Um, no, there was a lot of people pushing wheelbarrows full of... <laughs> we still, <laughs> I still have not heard of mechanically assembled formwork for concrete no have you even, i haven't even heard of anyone really trying it on site it's very labor intensive building things yeah but he says that all of this can be achieved and then the second thing is think of the things that have been achieved without it houseman didn't have any of this equipment the chinese didn't have any of this equipment when they built the great wall of china and so and so yeah we should talk about Hausmann because this is going to come up again and again. So he is referring here to the broad demolition re and reconstruction of Paris to the neoclassical schema of um, Baron Hausmann during the sort of middle of the Second 19th century. Empire, yeah. yeah. So where, when from? Like 1850 I, to 1870-ish? Uh, really, it's the 1860s. The idea is we're going to get rid of the medieval streetscape of Paris. I mean, it wasn't literally medieval buildings. It was yeah. just the sort of ragtag nature. And we're going to make it into boulevards where, if you've ever wondered why the centre of Paris all looks the same, basically, you could build the same, like three different sizes of the same building. Yeah, everywhere. classic. And he's got, um, to illustrate this, he has, uh, there's the map of these where these boulevards were driven through, and then he has a picture of all of the, the tools of Hausmann, which are all of these extremely wonky looking wheelbarrows uh, shovels ladders and so on he's he's generally picked the, the most sort of picturesque and rustic looking examples of every particular genre yeah, he's got he's got, some, he's got <laughs> a very strange hod <laughs> what is that one in the corner it looks like a static electricity generator <laughs> i don't know anyway that. yeah these are clearly sort of taken out of um encyclopedias or something apparently the wheelbarrow was only just being invented in the in um, by Louis the Fourteenth by Pascal, it's not true. Not true. Um, that was an invention of the, I think, twelfth century in Europe. Although they'd had them for longer in China, brings about a great increase in productivity. The wheelbarrow. Yes. <laughs> he also has. I think. Let me just see if I can find a bit where he talks about the sort of people that will be involved. Here's another terrifying sight. A group of workmen go forth from one end of the barrage to the other. A platform descends above and rises again into the sky with man standing on it. It seems to run along cables and comes down at the end of the barrage. The foot pylons show scarlet with their coatings of lead red, cables white. The mountain dominates the scene. It may seem absurd, but the mind goes back to the giants building Valhalla. The gods are on earth and touch a lever in the machine room. An organ plays softly over a wild landscape. That's the engine. Um... <laughs> Herds of cows and goats browse on the last few leafy blades of grass amidst the splendours of these lofty heights. You may say to yourself, man is mighty. He himself assails the heavens. And in this Tower of Babel we hear the sounds of French. And the work goes forward in its most moving, most captivating. The, most, the thing is magnificent. And that's the end of a long description which really runs like that for, for several pages. <laughs> That's very good. I'm glad we've got that one. But there's lots there's lots of that sort of stuff. Everything is humming and energetic. And also the men. Things quickly come down to earth. But it is not really so. Here we have the lessons of building a dam can teach us. A. He's, for some reason, numbered this alphabetically instead of numerically as he does everything else. The use of the slide rule. For with it, we can resolve every equation. The laws of physics are the basis of all human achievement. B. A scrupulous overseer who will rise at 5 a.m pull a lever in the machine room which sets the hum in motion who will oversee the oiling of every part and issues his orders when needed so we have this superman he's been talked about earlier on c someone to do the drudgery of the, the plant together for construction of a dam involves 
a mountain railway with its engines and trucks, a system of overhead cables and pylons, and a system of distributing aggregate and concrete making machines. All the equipment must come together. So essentially, that's what you need. You need yeah. machinery. Yeah. You need proles, and you need a, a super and a slide rule. And with those things, you can do everything. You can move the earth. One of the really ambiguous figures in this book is the engineer. He mustn't get above himself. He mustn't have an aesthetic sensibility. He's got to be almost mechanical, but he's also a superman. Partly this is because he wants to be the engineer himself, but also the engineer is both someone who's not him, who he's very interested in, who has these limitations that he wants them to be aware of and to not exceed their limits or be led through naivety into degraded and uh, reactionary design decisions or to, to decorate their their engineering marvels in unnecessary aesthetic paraphernalia. At one level, he has to assert that there's something which he can do, which they can't do, which is that he's an architect. He has this understanding of deep time and the essential laws of right building and all that kind of thing. But he does also sort of want to be them, doesn't he? Absolutely. There's another element of the difficulty and contradiction of engineers, which is that he says also look that actually really he's unsure about whether it's this mighty overseer or the slide rule because he's also saying that this can all be achieved with quite ordinary people uh, uh, because yes. of the system yeah but his notion of what ordinary people is is a bit complicated as well i think he means people who literally aren't made of steel <laughs> whose bodies are soft we sort of states that at times. There's a psychological contradiction, which I'm sure will keep coming up through his life, and we'll have lots more of that. But that more or less, we're, we're now more or less at the end of the first part of the book. So he's established what he needs to do and the means. And we're going to go over the, some of this ground, I think, again. But the, the next two parts of the book are these two schemes. The conceptual ideal city. A city of three million. It's like Bruno Tatt's city, right? Which is of one million or whatever. I think we'll leave it there where he's decided what he needs and um, you can all await with abated breath what he's going to do. So on the next episode we'll be talking about these two proposals in which the various principles and um, imperatives which he's identified for the creation of a future city will be worked out in these two proposals. So thanks a lot for listening. Uh, yeah, thanks. Review in all the normal places. Yeah, thanks for... Thanks for email. We've got an email. email. Yeah. From in. Switzerland. But thank you very much. We've had we've had lots of lovely reviews. We had another review from Germany. Yes. Love, we love Germany. We had another one in the Netherlands. Well, first one in the Netherlands. Oh, very good. We love the Netherlands. Yes. Um, and lots more from um, more English-speaking parts of the world you're all very kind we're very grateful to all of you yes it's um it's very nice to know there are people listening it's yeah. very nice to hear about you so yes we're, until next time when we'll be getting on finally to the great outrage itself yeah it's great we tried to record this several times um it's but different. uh we were too drunk <laughs> uh luke fell asleep yeah but this time we were... all right bye bye bye